Hey, Kermit Weeks here at Fantasy of Flight, and uh, I'm actually in what is going to be our recording studio. We've almost got all the equipment in. I've got it all built out, so this is a big first that we've ever done anything out of here, so hopefully we'll do some exciting things in the future. And uh, Filmer has been digging through some of our archives, and oh my gosh, we came across some footage with a very early like VHS uh, camera that we had. And this was back when I had purchased the Junior Birchinol B-17 in Paris, Texas at Flying Tigers Airfield. And this was back in 1985 we went out to get this. So uh, you can see the, 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 the resolution and the early way that they used to do the text on the video. And uh, so anyway, uh, let's roll and see what we got here, Phil. I haven't seen this footage in so long, so I'm very excited to, uh, to see where all this is, uh, is going to go. Okay, this is flying up. We had an AT-11 at the time, uh, you know, which was a bomber trainer. There's the Flying Tigers airfield. It was a dirt strip, not even a grass strip. This was arriving, pulling out all of our bags. And... Made it. Tomorrow will be an interesting day. First day of work. First evening, sunset going down. Well, we pretty much got pretty wet. Woo! What do you think, Jim? We had somebody ridden out with a one-ton dually and a trailer. That's Jeff Blakey. He, uh, you know, has done a lot of engine work for us, and you know, we've got a video on him. So you can look up in his engine shop. Now, I had owned the airplane for uh, oh, at least a year or so now, and the first thing I did was we saw some corrosion on one of the horizontal on stabilizer spars, and uh, my girlfriend and I at the time took it off and actually loaded it in a U-Haul, and then we drove it home, and the first piece of machinery I ever bought from my machine shop was a milling machine, and I went out and I bought a T extrusion and I figured out and made a little jig to, uh, you know, put the taper on the top of the, the uh, elevator spark cap, horizontal stabilizer, and uh, off we went. So that was my first machining job. Yeah, man, let me tell you, man, it had rained. There was so much mud. I can't remember where we found this stuff, but it was, you know, like corrugated sheet metal stuff that had come off the side of a hammer. But look at all the mud there. Oh my gosh. The airplane had not flown in a long time. When I purchased the airplane from Junior Birch and all, he had had a little bit, that's our AT-11 back there, uh, he had had a little run-in with the law and uh, he was actually, I think, uh, in prison at the time when I bought the airplane. Uh, anyway, you can see all the mud, you know, just trying to do the best we could. We went out and bought a bunch of rubber boots. I think the other side was the stabilizer that I had fixed. There's the strip. There's the strip going Take down that way. Down there to the right. There was, there was a, you know, some trees you had to go through. <clears throat> Checking the landing gear. We brought jacks and all sorts of equipment. And somewhere in here, I went out and got a B-17 rating, uh, mainly with the EAA. Uh, they had the one, and uh, you know, I got a chance to do some flying there. So here we go, May 1985. And, uh, but I think I got this after because 
and they were putting some oil and changing the oil. I don't think the airplane had flown in, you know, at least a couple of years. Pulling everything off, checking it. I can't remember how much time was actually on the engines, uh, you know, when I purchased it. Hey, Jeff Blakey, he's a, an engine guy. His father, Rudy Blakey, and he ended up doing the engines at some point. And this airplane actually flew in the TV series 12 o'clock high. The oil on number three. Susie Q. I mean, it had some other paint jobs on it, you know, for different filming opportunities. So here, I believe what we've got is we pre-oiled it. We pulled the plugs out. And we're just basically turning it through. Well, I guess we're starting. There we go. Yeah. Somebody up there with a fire extinguisher. So this is engine number one. That'd be number two, three, and four on the right side. Now you got to realize carburetors haven't been overhauled, none of the accessories. This is just as I purchased the airplane. So the uh, story would unfold slowly as we uh, move forward. Of course, it's been sitting a while. And, uh, you know, you get a well collected in the exhaust stacks. And this has turbochargers uh, that are down at the bottom here. And they're spinning up the, whoop, got some flame out there. Um, and of course the oil collects, and as soon as it starts getting hot, it just burns off the smoke, eventually clears up. As you can see it coming out the turbo right there. That's the exhaust. Now the turbos, I don't think were working. I don't think anybody in the B-17, there, there might have been one B-17 that actually used the turbos, but I think most people are running them without them. They still let them spin, but they don't actually allow them to, you know, boost up the, uh, the power because we're all flying at low altitudes here. Number two engine, trying to get it going. So here we're starting number three, running it. Yeah, so if this was May of uh, 1985, the Weeks Air Museum, I don't think, opened until the fall of 1985. And in January of 1985, I purchased the Tall Mance collection. So all of a sudden, I had this big uh, collection of airplanes. And I started looking for land up in uh, central Florida because I realized I had out collected the facility after five years of permitting and building and stuff. You know, we had the biggest hangar on the field in Tamiami Airport in Miami, but uh, I outgrew the facility before we ever opened the doors to the public. Starting number four. Now we're down on the gear. You can see we got the jacks out of the way that we use to test the landing gear. B-17 is a is a great fun flying airplane. I mean, it, it, it's like a four-engine Piper Cub from my perspective. It just really flies flies nice. Still kind of trying to get all the cylinders firing. Of course, by this time we had, you know, replaced all the spark plugs and cleaned them and probably put new spark plugs in. Some of my early employees. 
boys. All right. That's how the guys got in and out. See, I have my boots on. It's our one ton dually with a gooseneck trailer. some more engine runs, probably tweaking little things here and there. And, uh, you know, Jeff Blakey, uh, the engine guy, you know, he was a, he was just a, such a valuable asset to what we were doing here. And at the time, you know, I knew more than likely we were probably going to send the engines off to them, but I just didn't realize when. Oh, here we go. We're going to taxi it. Of course, they started moving. Check the brakes. I think we've got plywood here under here to try and get it out of the mud. Running them up a little more. Certainly don't want to put it up on its nose, but look how look how much the tire is sitting in the mud. Just trying to be careful that we don't uh, nose it up. There we go. We got the right wheel up on there. The left one didn't look like it was going to come out, so <laughs> we were doing the best we could. So we got the right wheel out. Well, we got her out of the mud. She about ready to go. And there's a, that was the tail wheel right there. So I think at this point, we'd finally gotten it out of the mud. Like I said, this is a really early uh, uh, VHS camera. By noon, huh? Like the other one? By noon, just like that. It's not look like we're going to maybe do some more gear retracks there or something. Yeah, we got the jack up under the deal. This is one of those positions where it's comfortable to work at. There you go. That's right. Checking all sorts of stuff. So some more gear retracks. It takes a long time for the gear to go up and down. It's all it's electric. Um, and then when it comes down here, you'll see the over center thing go up there. Right here, it'll go clunk and it'll go over center like that. So it's got a little bit of a V in there. It's going up and down. So we got some nice weather there. Yeah, this brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> oh my God. Now, there we go. And unfortunately, I went out there and I felt bad. So this is me, like, you know, cutting some of the, the stuff down to where, you know, because things had grown up since Junior hadn't been flying for a couple of years. And unfortunately, I, I cut one tree down and I felt bad. He came out and he said, y'all cut down my pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, this was all part of the plan. I can't remember. We probably went out and bought. I don't think we we brought a chainsaw with us. We probably went out and had to buy one. So here we are. You see the the landing gear going over center right there. We're just checking different things, and you know, at some point, you know, the brakes, and we're just doing more gear swings. Of course, there's an emergency thing in the cockpit where if the electrical system doesn't work or something's not working, you can actually hand crank these up and down as well as the flaps, I believe, from my memory. It's been a long time. Going back up. Now, ultimately, what we were going to do was, this was uh, Junior Birchinol's Flying Tigers Field, which is just a dirt strip. But on the other side of town in Paris, Texas, there was a really nice airport with three paved runways. I think it was a train and base during the war. And we basically, uh, you know, the plan was to basically just get the airplane over there and then check it. So uh, one of the times when we were doing something, I jumped in the AT-11 and I flew around the city, like about 12 miles around, and I was looking for fields where if we had a problem, you know, I could go ahead and 
you know, land it in a field or belly it in a field or something like that. I just, I wanted to just understand what the, here we go, May 4th, 1985. There's our trailer. That's, he had some hangers back there. He had a little museum actually at one point. Uh, looking pretty good there, pretty proud. Packing things up. We think we're going to be like ready for, uh, you know, a test flight. This last time? Yep. Should be. Buttoning everything up. We can only hope. Bat down the hat. Putting the cowling back on. Chopping down some more trees. <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful world of warbirds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't believe some of the stuff we did. Now, I had, by this time, I had just gotten my B-17 rating, okay? I only had four hours in a B-17. Uh, like I said, we flew the EA one up from, I think we, I picked it up in uh, Wichita, the B-17 had been down there with the EAA, and we ended up uh, flying it back to Oshkosh, and then I flew for my rating ride, got the type rating. Got everything else, but we had recovered all the control surfaces uh, at some point. Kind of getting ready. Packing everything up. Oh, I remember at some point we had a, uh, uh, oh, it got stuck. I taxied it around the deal and this wheel got stuck. So we had to get the, one of the trucks there. So we've got a big strap on here and we're gonna pull the, the tail that way to try and get the, uh, we've got this chalk over here. We're trying to get that left wheel out of the muck because it was so <laughs> anyway we were dealing with all sorts of uh, interesting issues oh my god this all this the memory's coming back there we go just slowly trying to pull it out and uh junior's kid uh Sammy, I think was his name, Birch and all. Here we go, there we go, it came out there. Almost, almost. And he had a phrase that he would tell stories about things that were like you looking at them with your eyes open like, you gotta be kidding me. And he would always finish, he'd go, if I'm lying, I'm dying. <laughs> that was a phrase Sammy Birch and all would always say. Oh my God, I can't remember how long we were there but uh, here we go, so you can see where it was in the mud. And uh, so now we're finally getting it out. <laughs> That's how deep the road. That is Monty Chumley. He was my hangar mate with my aerobatic days. He had a pits, and he at one time flew for Howard Hughes for a short time. He was back in the days out of Roosevelt Field after Lindbergh left. It was a part of that whole early golden age of aviation. Well, after we got bogged down, that knocked four hours out of our day. We're just now finishing the fueling. The sun's just about to go down. And we elected to go out first thing in the morning because the uh, probably be about 20 degrees cooler. We got a little bit more power. And I want it's calm. We flew it out the next morning. I flew it out. I had one of my aerobatic guys uh, that I knew, Ray Williams right here, he was out of uh, Springfield, Tennessee, and here we are checking the oil for the last time, you know. Find any gold? It was a little shiny in the fading light, but anyway, Ray had never been in a P-17 in his life. I threw him in the right seat, but he did have a multi-engine rating. And I've got four hours in the B-17 now in a tire rating. Draining the fuel, yeah, so this is the evening before uh, we were going to fly it out the next morning. We got the runway clear, doing the last minute oil checks. Uh, there we go, May 5th. So May 6th is the next morning that we flew it out. And uh, of course we were all in anticipation. There's the moon going. Oh my god, that's a full moon. 
So really, that's how we get in the airplane. I think I, I know I could still do that. You're on video here. So there was just three of us in the airplane apparently when we flew it out. So here we are the next morning, cranking it up. Oh my gosh. And so now, since we were only going 12 miles, I was just going to do a gear down ferry. So I wasn't going to put the land gear up and down. I didn't need anything to go because we're only going to go for 12 miles. And so, you know, it shouldn't have been a problem. So we've got number three running, trying to get number four. There we go. Put some primer in it. Come on, come on, baby. There we go. We got that one running. Number two. Now pay attention to that engine right there. <laughs> Even after running them, you see how much oil collects in there. It still smokes on the next day. Cranking number one. Always got a fire bottle handy just in case. A little more fuel. Got a nice day. Can't can't beat that. And uh, fortunately, there was either there was probably no wind or a little wind. So we actually you know took off. I, I taxied down the runway just to make sure that, you know, we have a little bit going on. Uh, and this, I think, is actually probably just coming back, maybe. Um, tax it down. It might have been the other end of the road. But we took off from where the little museum was. It was, like, right on the road there. And uh, the end of the run was right off the road. Yeah, so this is kind of like taxing them back. Just getting the feel, make sure the brakes work and stuff, because prior to this, you know, we'd only done a little bit there, and then we got the, the wheel got stuck in the mud again. Making sure the runway, you know, was, was hard enough to get the thing out. Of course, I'm going to take off with probably quarter flaps there. In fact, 15 degrees of flaps or whatever, whatever the manual calls for. Yeah, so there's the strip. So I'm not taxiing back and we're going to be taken off this way. The pear tree was over here. I feel bad about that. I, I didn't see any pears. So here we go. This is the takeoff. He's going out. Got to see, got the flaps down. Kermit's first solo flight in the B-17. And she is up and running. Okay, we are off. We're going to gear down ferry, and I want you to look at engine number two. We'll see a few puffs. Puff, and then basically uh, we. Oh man, no, I put the gear up. I did put the gear up. I'll be darn. I forgot about that. So anyway, so we headed off, and uh, that engine kept puffing there. Yeah. So here's the. Uh, Take off again, going out, and I want you to notice the three puffs. Of course, the gear is starting to go up. I forgot that I'd done that, but the number two engine uh, started puffing some smoke. I didn't really, uh, you know, think too much at the time, because right now we're just trying to get everything over. But within about a minute, what happened was, is all of a sudden the uh, engine temp on number two started going up, and the oil pressure started going down. Here, the AT11 is following us over to Paris, Texas. Uh, my girlfriend was flying it at the time, and uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I had to shut number two down, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the feathering pump didn't work, so as we were heading over there, uh, you know, the engines were running fine, but the uh, uh, 
when we went to feather number two, it wouldn't feather, so we had, it was just windmilling, so we had extra drag. So, you know, I mean, it was good that I checked the route in case there was some kind of a problem where I had to uh, basically, uh, you know, put it in a field or something like that. But we got over there, made a nice landing, and uh, stay tuned for part two.